In a sudden, violent decompression, six men on the Biford Dolphin oil rig were catapulted into the midst of one of history's most terrifying diving mishaps. What started as a standard saturation dive quickly turned into a nightmare, leaving only one survivor severely injured. On November 5, 1983, in the Frigg gas field of the Norwegian sector of the North Sea, four divers, Roy P. Lucas, Edwin Coward, Truls Helvik, and Bjorn Gjever Bergersen, were assigned to perform crucial maintenance tasks deep under the rig. They were supported by two dive tenders, William Crammond and Martin Saunders. Truls Helvik and Bjorn Bergersen descended to an astonishing depth of 295 feet to carry out essential repairs on the subsea infrastructure. Their ability to reach such depths was made possible by a diving bell, which provided access to pressurized chambers where the divers could temporarily reside. Unlike conventional diving methods, which limited underwater stays to a few hours, saturation diving allowed the divers to endure extended periods in the depths, sometimes up to 28 days, living, working, and sleeping in confined high pressure conditions. Life on the Biford Dolphin was a relentless challenge. The oil company demanded long, exhausting shifts, often lasting up to 18 hours, with minimal rest periods of just three hours before the crew was back at work. The financial rewards were significant, with monthly salaries ranging from $30,000 $45,000. But they came at a high cost, both physically and mentally. The rig operated like a finely tuned machine, relying on the unwavering efforts of its crew to maintain operations in the harsh, unforgiving environment of the North Sea. However, beneath the surface, tragedy was waiting. What was supposed to be routine maintenance quickly spiraled into chaos and terror. As the divers entered their pressurized living chambers, they had no idea that their sanctuary would become a place of horror. The diving bell chambers, including Chamber 1, Chamber 2, an escape capsule atop a lifeboat, and a trunk connected to the diving bell, offered a precarious refuge from the depths below. Operated by the dive tenders, William Crammond and Martin Saunders, the diving bell was their only lifeline, transporting them between the rig and the abyss below. The pressurized chambers situated atop the rig served as their temporary home, offering a semblance of safety amidst the vast expanse of the ocean floor. Yet, as they descended into the dark depths below, they were unaware of the hidden dangers lurking beneath the surface, ready to unleash their wrath with devastating outcomes. At the same time, a team controlled a diving bell with a crane while keeping an eye on the divers. Truls Helvik and Bjorn Bergersen had finished their work deep underwater and came up to the surface using the diving bell at 4 a.m. Once they reached the surface, the diving bell needed to be connected back to the living chambers, where Roy Lucas and Edwin Coward were resting for their next shift. Tenders, like William Crammond and Martin Saunders, help with important tasks like connecting the diving bell and managing the diver's lifelines. Even though Crammond and Saunders had been working for over 12 hours, they were ready to reconnect the diving bell when Truls and Bjorn returned. Crammond successfully linked the diving bell to the living chambers and safely brought Truls and Bjorn into one of the chambers. This team was used to this process, but something went terribly wrong. Crammond opened a clamp, causing a sudden decompression that tore through the living chambers. The diving bell disconnected, and the rush of air sent it flying, injuring Crammond and Saunders severely. Crammond later died from his injuries, and although Saunders survived, he was seriously hurt. He was found trapped under the heavy diving bell with collapsed lungs, back fractures, and a broken neck. Unfortunately, the fate of the four divers inside the chambers was tragic. The sudden decompression likely caused instant and painless deaths for them. Along with the implosion of the Titan submersible, it's considered one of the most horrifying undersea accidents in history. To explain what went wrong, it's vital to understand the dangers of decompression sickness on the human body, saturation diving, and the science behind what happened at the moment of the accident. One of the most feared conditions amongst deep-sea divers, more than a chance meeting with a kraken, 
Decompression sickness happens when a diver ascends from the murky depths too fast, causing their blood to literally bubble up as if it was boiling. Known as the bends amongst divers, it's one of the most challenging parts of diving simply because no amount of fancy or high-tech equipment can save a diver from it. During a scuba dive, divers take on an extra amount of oxygen and nitrogen in their compressed air tanks. Most of the oxygen is used up in your bloodstream, while the nitrogen is absorbed into various tissues. As divers go deeper and deeper, the literal weight of the ocean starts to bear down on them, creating intense pressure that compresses even the oxygen and nitrogen molecules in your tissues, causing the nitrogen molecules to dissolve much quicker and in higher concentrations. When a diver ascends too fast, the sudden drop in pressure causes the dissolved nitrogen molecules to suddenly bubble up as if it was boiling, causing a host of nasty and horrible conditions, excruciating pain, paralysis, sudden confusion, and in many cases, even death. However, what happened in the by 4 dolphin incident was a case of explosive decompression. Autopsy reports revealed that three of the men inside the chamber, Edwin Arthur Coward, Roy P. Lucas, and Bjorn Graver Bergerson, were essentially boiled from the inside when the nitrogen in their blood violently erupted into gas bubbles, killing them instantly. Truls Helovic, the fourth diver, endured the most horrifying fate amidst the chaos of the decompression event. Positioned directly in front of a partially open door to the living chamber, Helovic bore the full brunt of the explosive release of pressure. With unimaginable force, his body was violently drawn through the narrow aperture, tearing him apart and propelling his internal organs onto the deck in a gruesome spectacle. Following the disaster, investigators claimed the improper seal on the diving bell was due to an error made by William Crammond. They alleged that he mistakenly depressurized the diving bell early, while it was still connected to the habitat and the doors between were open. However, in 2008, the cause was found to have been an equipment malfunction, absolving Kramen. In one of the earliest attempts to study long-term deep-sea diving, researchers Edgar End and Max Knoll spent 27 hours breathing compressed air in a specialized facility in the County Emergency Hospital of Milwaukee back in 1938. The study was successful, with researchers determining various physical changes in blood chemistry because of the experiment, although the researchers required a five-hour decompression, which left Max Knoll with a mild case of the bends. Shortly after, in 1942, USN physician Albert Benke proposed saturating humans with inert gases using increased ambient pressures to avoid decompression sickness, a field of study that was explored further by another USN physician, Captain George F. Bond. Captain Bond began the Genesis Project in 1957 to prove the human body's capability of withstanding extreme environmental pressures and different breathing gases, a field of study that the U.S. Navy was keen on exploring to improve their submarine technology and give birth to the Man in the Sea program. By 1965, the Genesis Project had given birth to a wide array of research findings, allowing Westinghouse to perform the first commercial saturation dive to replace the Smith Mountain Dam's trash racks, which were located more than 60 meters below the surface. The Biford Dolphin oil rig was also using a severely outdated diving system. Construction on the rig finished in 1974, and by 1983, the diving system was already obsolete. Still, the company continued using this older system. Newer regulations might have prevented the disaster if they had been followed. Some theories suggest that the failure of the locking mechanism that held the diving bell to the living chambers was to blame, while others point to problems with the pressurization system or human error. Regardless of the cause, the results were catastrophic. The decompression caused an explosive rush of air out of the living chambers, sending the heavy diving bell flying and killing two of the tenders who were operating it. The oil boom in the North Sea, particularly off the coast of Norway, began in the 1960s after oil was discovered in the region. However, safety measures were not always prioritized during this period. Tragically, numerous diving accidents occurred, resulting in fatalities. 
the Bifur Dolphin incident prompted substantial changes in safety protocols for diving operations. Today, stringent risk assessments and hazard analyses are mandatory for all diving operations. Although the Bifur Dolphin's equipment passed the strict levels of certification required by Norwegian law, it operated in Norwegian territorial waters at the time, the Bifur Dolphin's equipment at the time of the incident had already been deemed obsolete and necessitated replacement, a fact that will be brought up during investigations. To counter drift and ocean currents, the Bifur Dolphin was equipped with engines capable of speeds of 4.5 kn, although long-distance relocations required the use of specialist tugboats. The Bifur Dolphin incident wasn't the first nor the last fatal accident that the rig would see. In 1976, just three years after its launch, the Bifur Dolphin ran aground during transit from the Frigg oil fields in the North Sea to the port of Bergen. All crew was evacuated onto lifeboats. However, because of rough seas at the time, six people died after falling off the lifeboats. Meanwhile, in 2002, a Norwegian worker was killed during an unspecified industrial accident on the rig, with the worker being struck on the head fatally with a piece of metal. These accidents, although few far apart, and involved separate different types of errors, not to mention the rig's lack of newer and better equipment and lower demand for oil, thanks to green living and alternate energy sources, resulted in it being laid up in 2016, with its remains being beached in Aliaga, Turkey. The Bifurd Dolphin incident was a sad reminder to everyone that, despite more than half a century of research, we know only a terrifyingly small amount when it comes to the science of decompression and saturation diving. As we prepare to part ways, if you've found yourself entranced by these awe-inspiring accounts of human resilience in the face of adversity, don't forget to click that subscribe button. Become part of our community for a wealth of thrilling narratives, adventures, and ventures into uncharted territory. So, drop a like and share this video with your comrades. Let's continue delving into the incredible tales our world holds. Until we meet again, maintain your sense of wonder, embrace courage, and persist in exploring the extraordinary. Until our next escapade, stay curious, stay bold, and keep unraveling the wonders of our world.